Oh, hello everyone. Um, on behalf of Rizzoli Bookstore, uh, my name is Christina. I'm the events manager here, and we're really honored and excited to be hosting the virtual launch event for Pollock's Arm by Hans von Trotha, um, translated from the German by Elizabeth Lofer. And this was meant to be an in-person event here in New York, and uh, the pandemic intervened, but we are very grateful for the chance to, to gather here online anyway. Um, and we want to thank our co-hosts, which is um, the publisher New Vessel Press and also Centro Prima Levi. Um, so just a few housekeeping things. I'm gonna keep it very short. Um, this event will wrap up around 7.15 and we will have time near the end for an audience Q&A. So as you listen to the conversation, please you know, think of your questions and comments and share them in the chat. And then the speakers will have a chance to discuss some of those towards the end. Please keep yourselves on mute during the conversation. Um, if you've already purchased your copy of Pollock's Arm through our Eventbrite page, you will receive an email very soon with you know, either your shipping information or information about in-store pickup. And I will share the link in the chat to purchase a copy if you haven't yet already. Um, and of course, the book is also available in our bookstore in New York um, near 26th and Broadway. Um, and we have a lot of great in-person and virtual, well, I guess just in-person now, um, events coming up. So we invite you to please, you know, visit the events calendar on our website um, for those and follow us on Instagram. Um, and we thank you for supporting this bookstore and for supporting great literature and translation like this book. So let me just briefly introduce our speakers tonight. Um, the author Hans von Trotha is a German historian, novelist, and journalist, and he's, of course, the author of Pollock's Arm. It's out in English this week, and uh, it's been receiving extraordinary praise and critical attention. Um, and he'll be in conversation tonight with the historian and anthropologist David Kurtzer, who's the author of the Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Pope and Mussolini. And our moderator tonight is Alessandra Kassen. He's the director of Centro Primo Levi's online magazine, Printed Matter, um, as well as CPL editions. Hans, David, and Alessandra, thank you very much for being here. And I'm going to turn things over to you now. Thank you, Christine. So for the audience, if you want uh, more in detail biographies, you will find them in the chat right below. This way we can just jump in and um, I'm glad to welcome you all. It's a pleasure to do this. Uh, Hans von Trotha has written a short, riveting, and intense novel. I will try to highlight some of its many merits, as well as explore some of the important questions it raises. So trying not to give away too much, allow me to outlaw, outline the plot. The no novel is conceived like a stage play through terse, dramatic prose and sophisticated dialogue, the author brings us inside the Vatican. Here, Kay, a Berlin school teacher, reports about his failed attempt to convince Ludwig Pollack, um, a famed Jewish archeologist, to take refuge in the Vatican. The exchange occurs on October 17, 1943, the day after the Nazi roundup of the Jews of Rome. In effect, the plot consists of an extended, very theatrical conversation uh, on the afternoon of October 15, so two days prior, between Kay and Pollock. Rather than accept the invitation to escape, Pollock chooses to take the time to retell in depth his extraordinary life as a sort of intellectual and existential testament. Born in Prague in 1868 into a German-speaking Jewish family, Pollock studied archaeology and acquired a vast classical culture. At a young age, he developed a lifelong passion for Goethe and Rome. He ends up in Rome, where he becomes a highly successful antiquarian, dealer, advisor to major international collections, and eventually the director of a Barraco Museum. The subtext here is that despite his impressive erudition, he did not have the academic career he surely deserved. He was what today we would call an eye, a connoisseur. In 1906, he established his reputation by discovering the missing arm of a famous Hellenistic sculptural group, Lao Khan and his sons, but had been dug up in the Renaissance with a missing arm. 
The assumed upright position of a right arm had informed much scholarship and interpretation. Uh, I will let uh, the author discuss the sculpture later, but the process by which the recovering of a missing fragment alters later interpretations of a whole is one of the recurring themes of a novel. A novel that's constructed as a series of Chinese boxes with stories within stories, pairs, mirror images, different versions and interpretations of the same set of facts. Much is alluded to without being explicitly stated. From the beginning of the last century through the 20 year fascist dictatorship, Italy and Rome in particularly, particular were the elective residents of German scholars, many of them Jews. Pollock earned, <clears throat> Pollock's work earned him a solid position and honorary titles from the Tsar, the Austrian emperor, the king, and the pope. Yet, on the wake of World War I, he was seen as an enemy alien and had to flee back to Austria. Five years later, he's again in Rome. So there are two Roman periods from where he witnesses the assault on his values by the hands of fascists. In sequence, his home, the museum that was entrusted to him, and his livelihood are stripped away. The novel contrasts Pollock's life devoted to scholarship and the study of antiquity with the brutal barbarism of Nazi fascism. Neither his beloved Goethe nor the connections he had formed with the lifetime, lifetime can spare him. The history of the deportation of the Jews of Rome and the history of this particular statue have been studied in depth. It is rather a bold decision to combine them as a the subject of a work of fiction. One of my goals in moderating the discussion is to unpack how the author has done this, with what scope and with what potential risks. By risks, I'm referring to the often ambiguous and slippery terrain on which Holocaust fiction of all, of all kinds is often grounded. You know, the reader can speculate on the motives of a fictional Pollock not to escape. He may not trust what awaits him in the car, or he might think that all is lost anyway. Rather than escaping, and this is crucial in the novel, he insists on offering testimony. Further and importantly, Pollock is not alone. His decision involves also the lives of his wife and two children. Pollock's choice to remain in his Roman palazzo or escape to the Vatican is of course a literary device. In reality, Pollock and his family had no choice. They were arrested and later deported to Auschwitz along with 1,022 Jews. The author attributes to Pollock, quote, a flair for telling authentic from fake. This is essentially his skill. I think it, it could also be taken as a warning to the discerning reader of this fascinating novel. So now, uh, without further ado, I will ask in turn both our guests two very broad questions, hoping in concise answers so that we can then follow up and engage in discussion. I will start obviously with Mr. Von Trott. Uh, well, first of all, congratulations for your novel. And let me mention also Elizabeth Lawford's excellent English translation. So to dive right in, uh, as we were talking before, Pollock Diaries, which you quote and paraphrase <clears throat> at length, spanned from 1886 to 1933. For the crucial period of the novel, October 1943, what other sources did you use or were you working mainly from your own imagination? No, I, I used a lot of sources. Um, I used the diaries um, uh, we have. So his whole story, which is told in the novel is mainly told by himself in the diaries. And there are lots of letters. I read a lot of letters and that was very important to learn about his character about the way he 
um, gets outrageous, how he was, he felt offended by not becoming a professor, by um, all these details were between the lines, uh, lines in the letters. And um, you mentioned one of the crucial points. It was, it's a short novel, but it was a lot, uh, a very long period uh, writing it because um, when I knew I wanted to do it, there was a lot of research to do, the whole Laocoon research, it's, it's uh, libraries uh, uh, on that, the situation in Rome by the time and everything I could find um, about him. The most difficult problem, and you just mentioned it, um, um, was to find a tone, to find a language, because who am I? to um, give words to a victim of the Holocaust on his last night, on, uh, on his last uh, day. And that was very difficult. And I tried in, my, in the first version, I tried to be as close as possible to his own voice in his letters and diaries, but that doesn't work. It's absolutely unreadable um, uh, for, as, a, as fiction today. So it was very difficult to invent uh, a language. And uh, that is why I also want to thank Elizabeth Laufer because it's amazing how she, as a young translator, um, imagined herself into that situation and into that language. And that's the crucial thing about translation. So yeah, that, um, that I, had, I had the facts. By the way, there were two people warning him and there was an apartment in the Vatican for him. He could have gone with his family. Um, I invented the third person coming. The other two that are mentioned um, um, were there. Well, and... I, I, uh, okay. I, I think I, 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 I am familiar with the source that you're referring to for the first two people. So you're probably talking about the Danish correspondent of Pollock called Jorge Hartmann. No. no, it was um, it was uh, a scholar at the um, um, at the Hertziana. It was no, no sorry, the, um, uh, it was not. It was um, um, uh, he, uh, the the archivist of the um, um, of the uh, of the um, in the library in the Vatican, a German, and it was a very uh, uh, not uh, not really clear as a person, an art dealer, who all, he who was between Germany and Rome, and so they both knew about the deportation. And okay. okay, just just to clarify for the audience, so it doesn't get too arcane. Uh, there is a story where, from different sources. I got it from somewhere else, but there was a late attempt on the part of a German. Uh, embassy to the Holy Sees mm -hmm. to save Pollock through these two individuals, an art historian and a person working at the embassy. Mm -hmm. Now, in the novel that we're dealing with, the author shifts this event from it being uh, the German embassy, the Holy Sees, to being the Vatican itself. Could you explain why the third person, why the shift in particular? Um, in the no, novel, I just it, wanted to for, for people to follow easily. Yes. The novel. It, is, it, is, it is not the Vatican like the Pope or the Cardinals. It is um, a retired diplomat of the Vatican. And this is a historical figure. He existed and he was a great fan of Pollock's. And he, that is, that is um, the part of fiction is he, I don't know, and we don't know what he did in these days, but we, he had a standing invitation for Pollock to come to the Vatican um, since the Germans were in town. So there was, um, there was somebody, it was not the Vatican as, a, and, and I, I don't say it's the Vatican, I say it's him, this person. Monsignor with Fioretti. So that's it, that's him. Okay, okay, but okay, let, let, let's, try to, let's try to make it simple for the people who have not read the novel to yes. see what's happening. So in the novel, within the many stories that uh, Pollock tells, there's often this technique of shifting perspective, shifting who's telling what and how actually a fact occurred. Mm -hmm. 
Now, the, straight, the device that I was pointing to is that the author of a novel uh, found some evidence, which I'm not sure that it's historical evidence, but some documents saying that there was an attempt to save him. And the attempt was probably from the German uh, embassy to the Vatican. And in the novel, it gets transformed. So mm -hmm. I hope that this was understandable. Maybe we, we, we move for a second to Professor Kurtzer for an overview and we come back to this. So uh, perhaps we could start, um, you know, as a historian, can you briefly describe the context in which the drama of a novel unfolds? Aside from conjecture, what do documents show about the Vatican diplomacy awareness or lack of regarding the impend impending roundup? Well, just you know, briefly to give the context, uh, it was September 8th, 1943, that the uh, armistice is announced with the allies and immediately thereafter, the Germans sweep into uh, Italy and take over most of Italy, including Rome uh, within a couple of days. And um, it will be very shortly thereafter, September 24th, that uh, Herbert Kappeler, who's the head of the SS in Rome, gets a cable from Himmler saying that all the Jews of, uh, of Italy are to be seized and liquidated. Uh, he then, a couple of weeks later, October 11th, gets a renewed telegram calling for the complete elimination of, of the Jews of Italy. So how much of this um, gets leaked out in one way or another remains controversial. Uh, it would seem that the Vatican would have some idea what the, we do know. And they, they just opened the Vatican archives for this period um, a couple of years ago um, in March of 2020. And we, uh, we know that the Vatican, the Pope was very well aware of the Holocaust as, as it was going on. Um, whether they knew exactly that it was going to be October 16th, the morning of October 16th, that the SS was going to try to round up the Jews is not known. Um, most of the men had already gone into hiding because it was thought it was just the, the uh, men who were most at risk. And so for most of the Jews in Rome, it, was, it came as a great surprise. First of all, it came as a surprise they were all rounded up, including little children and uh, old people. Uh, but also they had no idea where they were about to be sent. Um, and they would be, so they are, um, the novel takes place just before the day before the roundup or the, the main scene of um, the uh, emissary of the Vatican trying to convince uh, Pollock and his family to come for protection to Vatican City. I actually found, I'll be interested, uh, Hans in the document which said there was a uh, place in Vatican City for him. He was a big, benefactor of, of the Vatican, the Vatican museums. Um, but it's, it would be highly unusual because the Vatican, uh, there are very few Jews in Vatican City, protected in Vatican City, only a handful. And most of them had snuck in they had, and were um, periodic attempts to kick them out. So uh, it would be very unusual uh, if uh, that had anything like that had actually happened. Um, but in terms of the, the Pope, the Pope uh, was not happy about the Jews being rounded up. For one thing, the Pope historically would saw uh, the Jews of Rome as the Pope's Jews. Uh, for centuries, they had come under the Pope's authority as the Pope King in the Papal States. And it was a great embarrassment, aside from the fact he wasn't happy they were rounded up, it was also a great embarrassment to him. He finds out by 7 a.m. the morning of the 16th when they're being rounded up, uh, relatively early in the roundup, and uh, calls on a secretary of state to summon the German ambassador of the Holy See, whom he does. And we have more or less transcript that the Cardinal Secretary of State provided of that meeting, where he says, you know, this is terrible rounding up the Jews, uh, I appeal to your humanity, um, can you do something? And he's, uh, he, the response from uh, Weizsäcker, the ambassador is, this has basically been ordered by Hitler, do you really want me to protest to him? And the answer is no, uh, I didn't say that. And in fact, the uh, Pope never does protest uh, the fact that the, the Jews are rounded up and um, a fairly large number of Jews would find refuge in, in some of the convents and monasteries in Rome, but this was not because the Pope ordered it, it was because uh, they were among 
thousands of other refugees. Uh, so the great majority of refugees in the monasteries at the time in Rome were not Jews. They were people trying to avoid being drafted into um, either forced labor or the uh, neo-fascist military. That's you know, very roughly the context. Thank you. Can, can, can I ask more specifically, if you came across any documents or evidence regarding Pollux and his family's arrest or attempt to intercede afterwards? Yes, yeah, so um, I have been working in these newly opened archives of the Vatican uh, for this year, and there is a folder that I found uh, on the Pollock case. However, there's nothing in it having to do with anything arranged beforehand. It all happens afterward. And the first document there is, in fact, by a, a senior librarian at the, uh, the, uh, the Vatican Library who is uh, who writes to, um, I think, uh, uh, Monsignor Montini, who at the time is one of the top people in the Vatican Secretary of State. Later, he'd become Pope himself as Paul VI. And he appeals to Montini on behalf of his friend and the esteemed colleague uh, who's been taken from his home. But this is after the fact. And he makes no mention of having uh, had contact with him beforehand. You know, I don't know. Uh, subsequently, the uh, wife, uh, Pollock's wife's sister, was not taken. And she appeals to the Pope. Uh, a couple of days later, and um, for the Pope to intercede. And then what's kind of interesting to me is months later, there's a rumor that uh, the friends of Pollock hear that he's still alive, and they write to the Pope. And this is now in August of uh, the following year of 1944, so practically a year later, they still don't know what's happened to Pollock. And the, the Vatican doesn't know, which is kind of interesting. So Montini in September, 1944, we now have this document in these newly opened archives, sends a telegram to the, um, uh, the nuncio in Switzerland, who's the one who's kind of a go-between in these matters, uh, seeing if he can contact the uh, Germans and the Italian fascists, because the rumor is that uh, he's being held in a concentration camp in the Varese area in Northern Italy. And, uh, so Monsignor, the future Pope, uh, Montini, uh, appeals for information on behalf of the family, whether he's still alive, and if so, to do what they can to protect him. Okay, thank you. So to go back to the novel, uh, uh, oh, oh, uh, first of all, David, correct me if I'm wrong, but for if people don't know this, I think that it's important to know that wherever Germans deported Jews throughout Europe, any kind of attempt to intercede had to be, be between the arrest and when they put them on the trains. Mm -hmm. Once they put them on the trains, there's no historical evidence that anybody was taken back. So an attempt a year later or a month later is uh, a not a potentially effective one by any, by any means. Moreover, we're talking about arrests having been done as the novel uh, details on September 16th, they were taken to this military academy, Collegio Militare, and they left for uh, Auschwitz on the 18th. So it all happened very quickly. A week later, uh, the Pope or anybody would not have had a chance to save Pollock or any of these people on the train. So just to clarify. And now to get back uh, to uh, Mr. Von Trotta, maybe it's, it's uh, helpful for the audience and anybody who has not read the book, if you could explain a little bit where uh, there are discrepancies in the character you created with the historical person and how you uh, navigate moving from documents regarding the actual historical person to the construction you made. There is, um, unfortunately, there is not a biography um, of Pollux. He, he is, he, it is very interesting that um, his role as an archaeologist in, in Rome was so important. And um, his role, not only for the Vatican, but also for a lot of museums was very important. But he is, he's mentioned, but um, he is ne has never been part of greater research. That is coming now, which is uh, absolute uh, time uh, to do. So I didn't, I couldn't, I didn't have much except the, um, uh, the diaries and the letters uh, I found in archives. Um, and 
So, so I had his narrative and it was pretty clear for me very early that I need um, kind of a firewall to the um, novelistic part. And that was the invent, uh, inventing this person, um, this German teacher from Berlin coming um, and also kind of telling his story, um, how he discovers that he will not save him and how he's reporting. It is a report about a report. It's a double indirect speech in the end. Um, that gave me the possibility to create a character as you described it very nicely by his own speech, by his own, um, by telling his life. And um, I've, a lot of these elements in his biography are taken from moments from the diaries and the letters. Um, the only part which is completely uh, invented is the part about uh, the statue, about Laocon, because he never talked about it. He wrote a very, very thin um, uh, not, essay, which is not... Uh, okay, okay. So um, you have Pollock say on this matter, Laocon is not a statue. Like Rome, it's an, he's an idea, it's an idea, and my arm destroyed that idea. Yes. Among the many interesting shifts in perspectives in the novel, there is a move from Virgil's Lacuan story, which is necessary for Aeneas to found Rome, to Pollock's late suggestion that Lacuan, in other tradition, is killed by snakes, not for opposing the entry of a horse into Troy but rather for having sex with his wife in a yes. sacred temple. I, yeah, I've, 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 found, I've found that in my research in, in the Locon, it's, it's, it's part of the, um, uh, of, of the scientific li literature. And I went to ask anybody I could um, um, doing research also in the Vatican museums, also in archeologic um, uh, research places, um, what they think about this, um, uh, about this possibility. And there are a lot of good reasons that it's not the story with Aeneas we know. Um, uh, and this other myth had been uh, shown in statues Obviously, that is uh, what I learned from. And I thought that is, um, uh, the longer I read about Laocon, I thought that is really makes the statue even more unbelievable because it is not heroic. And that gave me the idea, okay, when, when the arm is not erected in a, hero in, a, in a sublime heroic way, but when it is really like that as it is today, uh, because it is uh, Pollock's arm, um, that responds to this shift in the myth. There is, it mirrors it. And uh, so that gave me the, the idea uh, to, yeah, to put that in, 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 Pollock's worth, uh, in, in Pollock's words, in Pollock's mouth, um, to explain this um, as I really, which for me um, uh, is a, a really, um, an, a part of the novel which is not in it, uh, but besides, actually the finding of this arm changes the, um, yeah, the, the whole character of the statue. The German and part of the international view on um, antiquity is, had been um, in, kind of invented in the 18th century by Winkelmann, Goethe, Lessing in the Laocon discussion. It is Laocon, which they are talking about. And actually this discussion is deeply affected by this arm, but it never happened. It had never been mentioned. It has took 50 years until they put it to the statue and never, um, and, and there is no comment in any Winkelmann edition uh, that he saw a small copy of the statue uh, with the wrong arm when he wrote this, um, this essay. Fascinating. Um... I would like to ask a question to both of you. Uh, Ludwig, Ludwig Pollack, the actual person, was murdered 79 years ago. 
a time which is emotionally and politically very close to us. I mean, he could have direct living descendants. In the novel, Kay arrives to Pollock's home, presumably at some point in the afternoon, because when he leaves, it's, yet, it's not yet dark, and we're in mid-October when the sun sets early. So let's assume that he leaves, but it all happens in the afternoon of that Friday. Pollock repeatedly states that his wife is ill and his two grown-up children, ages 25 and 33, are sleeping. Why are they sleeping on a Friday afternoon? I quote from the novel, I couldn't possibly disturb them, not after they have finally found rest. Is one of the possible readings that you're, suggestion, you're suggesting that Pollock has orchestrated some kind of assisted suicide or has killed them to spare them what inevitably was coming? As a matter of fact, they were ill. Um, they uh, had, uh, after all I uh, see from the letters, he didn't talk very much about his family. So, um, but obviously they were not, they were not allowed to work anymore um, uh, uh, anyway in 1943, but even before they were not able to work anymore, they were, had depressions and they were, so, um, so um, the, me trying to imagine the, the Pollock's everyday life was really a life, a very depressed life of, um, uh, yeah, uh, two children, the daughter just died, one daughter just died. And, um, yes, and, and the two others, were not working and were not, um, uh, were kind of, yeah, in a kind of, we would say, depression. And um, the second wife um, uh, uh, it was very ill. Diabetes. So um, this kind of, uh, yeah, this, I would say there are different reasons in the book why he doesn't follow and one of them yes is it is um there is no place for this family in the world i would say that is and but are you suggesting that he you want people to think that he might have that they might have been dead at that point i'm, I'm no. asking this not because i think it's such a uh, the reason i'm asking for the readers at large is if a family had been have been dead his decision to save himself in the Vatican or not is an individual act. He, he can decide what he wants to do. But if the wife and the children are alive, he is choosing not to save them. It's a morally, ethically, a very different decision to me as a reader. Absolutely. And um, it is, uh, the, it is uh, a moral, morally extremely complicated, uh, difficult question which remains. Um, and um, given that he had any chance to do that, um, uh, and he, um, I don't see him as a person who would have discussed that. I see him as a, as a person who would have decided that. And you have, one has to say one of the reasons which are in the novel, uh, in the very end uh, it is, which is, he didn't really believe that it is going to happen. He, um, he was pretty sure that they would not take him because he was ill and old, because he was so important, because they would need him. He says that a couple of times and he, um, and we know that many, um, uh, also in Germany, um, uh, many Jewish scholars thought that uh, sadly and, 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 and uh, so, um, I, I thought about that a lot and I decided not to make it, uh, the, the family is mentioned quite often because he mentions them that um, also uh, always in the same position as him. He always says, this is not for me and, and my family. This is, um, so they are in, in his opinion, they're in the same position as he is. Okay, um, in the novel, 
this this shifting from Pollock's life to implications of a sculpture of Lacan work in very different and sophisticated ways at different points in the novel. At the end, is there some suggestion that his children are like Lacan's children or not? In which way do you mean? So uh, the, the association is there. Uh, it comes a couple Lachlan of times. Lacan dies yes. surrounded by two children he's trying to save. Yes. Yeah, um, uh, and uh, um, and he himself says, where is the mother? He, he asks for the mother of the, uh, um, um, yes, it is. Uh, they, um, I, the longer I told these two stories parallel, the more it became kind of a mirroring um, uh, thing. And um, that, yeah. Uh, this, yeah. um... uh, for David, I'm curious uh, what uh, uh, Mr. Von Trotta just said about older Jewish men in Rome, uh, not their disbelief that they would be taken away so old. So I think there's a, a, a very dif big difference from some uh, shopkeeper in the Rom Roman ghetto having this uh, belief and the sophisticated scholar who had corresponded with colleagues in uh, all of the German occupied air, Nazi occupied areas from the rays of Nazi. From 33, he writes all these, not, these letters and part of them are in the novel to people in museums asking why this person is not responding. Is he, did he retire or what happened? So he must have been keenly aware of how everything was clamping down. Jewish intellectuals, professor and museum directors had been removed from their place. So, so why would he think that he would be so special that they wouldn't touch him? Particularly because in the first part of the novel, we learned that the Pope had given him titles, medals for the arm in 1906. And then this did not spare him in 1919 when World War I to be seen as Austrian subject and thus an enemy of Italy. Mm -hmm. This is what I don't understand, because on the one hand, this man was enormously aware of what was going on. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. interesting question. So on the one hand, um, well, you know, when the Germans first arrived in early uh, September, the German troops took over Rome, uh, the then chief rabbi of Rome, Israel Zoli, who was actually from Central Europe himself, he'd previously been in Trieste, uh, but I think came from similar areas probably to uh, Pollock. Uh, he immediately called on the leadership, lay leadership of the Jewish community of Rome to um, tell all Jews to go into hiding. He, uh, because he was in touch or had some kind of communication with Central European Jewry, uh, but the lay leaders refused saying it would create panic. They didn't believe it, um, and tragically, um, what is, and so he went into hiding, the, the chief rabbi went into hiding and left kind of his congregation behind. Uh, but uh, the, the Jews didn't now, as I mentioned before, the younger men, most of them did go into hiding. So when the Jews were rounded up that day, the great majority were women and children, not adult men. So the kind of the cur most curious thing to me in a way about the Pollock situation isn't so much that he and his wife and daughter perhaps stayed uh, there and uh, perhaps thought he'd be protected because of his uh, Vatican, uh, not only Vatican, but he was also a distinguished men, member of the German Archaeological Institute and so on. Uh, this somehow would protect him, but that his son, who was, you know, was he 25 or 30, 30. Uh, that he wouldn't have gone to hiding, that seems very surprising to me. Um, and uh, the fact is, the Germans, uh, yeah, just to pick up a point you made earlier, Alessandro, about okay, once the Jews are on the train, that's it. Uh, there was that 48 hour period, more or less, between when the Jews were taken from their homes, mm -hmm. put in the military college right outside the walls of Vatican City, and when they were put on the train to Auschwitz. Uh, and they would arrive there the following Saturday and um, met by Dr. Joseph Mengele who would make the selection and the great majority were sent directly to the gas chambers, including probably uh, all but the son. Although 
as was mentioned, the, uh, the appeals being made right after he was taken, not only talk about uh, he suffering uh, Ludwig Pollock from heart problems and his wife from diabetes, but that his children weren't in the best of health either. But uh, I'm not sure, I haven't seen any further evidence of what, what the issue was. So possibly the son uh, was sick enough that he thought uh, he was, uh, or his father thought he wouldn't be taken either. Um, but in a way, what's, uh, so on the one hand, you would think he would know better, but there was also a bit of this uh, feeling in the uh, kind of cultured, uh, upper class, highly educated, um, Jewish uh, community who believed, you know, the Germans somehow could never do what they in fact were, had been doing for quite a while. You'd think they would know better, but uh, not all cases did they. And there were, how would you, would you say um, there's one story which is not invented, which is, uh, which happened that Kapler, Kapler obviously hesitated to um, uh, act against the Jews, the Jews uh, for, quite, for quite a long time. And then there was this action that the Jews who were supposed um, uh, to deliver uh, a certain amount, I think 50 kilograms or whatever of gold. Right. And if they would deliver it, he would leave them. In, in, and he said, if they don't um, uh, manage to deliver it, he would send 200 of them away. Um, wouldn't, um, and in the, in the Museo Ebraico in Rome, there is a glass with the, um, with the receipts for this gold, which I think is very, um, and uh, didn't, is, wasn't that a kind of an action which could have given a person like Pollock the idea, you see, Things don't, you say they happen, but they so far they never happened? Yes, although I, I would dispute the question of Kepler uh, hesitating about uh, having any moral compunctions about taking the Jews to Rome. Um, after, I'd be very cautious about any um, you know, testimony after the fact about what actually happened, uh, since it all tends to be exculpatory that you know, they were opposed to it, but uh, you know, okay. when it went through. Um, that said, the episode you mentioned, where which does take place, um, I think the end of September of '43, where uh, Kapler calls, calls in the heads of the Jew, lay heads of the Jewish community and says, uh, "You've got to provide me with whatever 50 kilograms or something of gold, uh, or we're going to uh, seize 200 Jews and send them send them off." Uh, and the Jews do accumulate basically golden you know, ornaments of uh, congregants and so on and, and bring it in. Uh, but there's no evidence that he was ever ordered to do that from Berlin. And it's also it doesn't seem to be clear whatever happened to that gold. So that whole episode seems bizarre, but it, it did happen. And so you're, you are, I think, the, however, uh, you're right that some of the Jews might have interpreted that as, you know, Gee, we you know escaped uh, the least immediate danger by by doing that. Um, perhaps uh, Mr. Van Trotta would like to tell us a little bit about what, as a person, writing this novel has done to you. <laughs> um, a lot. Um, because it, I first heard of uh, Pollack in a novel, interesting enough, not, not as a scholar, but in a novel, very, a beautiful German novel by Helga Schütz, a German author, who wrote a semi-autobiographical novel called Sepia. And uh, there, um, a young girl goes from East Germany to Rome, and there she discovers uh, the story of Pollack. And after I had read it, it never left me. For the, it was about two, three years. I always had this story. And I think I have, I have to because what first what I, as a scholar and as a writer, thought is interesting is the different timelines that cross in this life, like antique uh, art, then the Renaissance, the role Laocon played for Renaissance, then 18th century. Uh, the new archaeology, then the finding of the army in 1903, the high time, the golden years of, uh, uh, of, of Pollack, then First World War, 
and then this tragic end. But the more I started to do, and I did, I, I wrote a historical novel before about First World War. And then this, I did a lot of research, but I did all for my own. I didn't talk to anybody, I did it for my own. And this time I thought I want to do it differently. I talked to a lot of people. I went to archeologists, I went to, um, uh, to Rome a lot. I talked to many people. Um, and the situation became kind of clearer for me. I, I learned a lot uh, also about art history, about archeology, span about the Vatican museums. Um, and this, the moment itself, um, so if it is true that somebody warned him and he didn't go this moment, how could the, which answer could there be? And the more I read him, I had this kind of, uh, yeah, talking with him. The, um, I was in Rome, I wasn't allowed to go into the apartment. I, I never saw the apartment, I was never allowed to go in but there's a little restaurant where you can see it. And I sat there a lot and tried kind of to imagine what happened in there. And uh, the material I had was uh, the letters and the diaries I had read um, and the other books I read about the time. And the more different answers showed up about how you wouldn't go. And that, I had very different states. I had the states uh, of moral, um, um, the, how could you do that to your family? I had this uh, fascination for this um, uh, scholarly ca career. Um, I often ask myself how much do I really like him because he, he, he was a peculiar character that is even clear in his letters and, um, and in, so, um, and for a very long time, I didn't know how I couldn't, could do that um, in a novel doing justice to the person, to the characters, which um, are mentioned and telling all these stories which you um, unfolded in, uh, in your introduction. Um, that was a very, very hard and long, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a hard work which occupied me completely. And um, when it was out, it was really like, yeah, it was, it was a part of myself which I, which I gave away, which is not always when I write a book because it was, um, yeah, it, it, it was all new for me as well. And um, I wouldn't, if you would have told me 20 years ago that I would allow myself to write a Holocaust uh, um, um, uh, novel, I would have said never ever. So um, that um, there were many, many, many um, uh, moments to go through before I could do that and allow that to me myself. So yeah, it did a lot. Thank you. Uh, oh, you know, this is clearly a very loaded period of time and people have studied so much and we're so, still so much what we don't know about really what occurred in those years. So my question to uh, Professor Kurtzer is, you know, uh, he claims to have found some uh, testimonies of this attempt to save him. And for the fictional uh, uh, purposes of this novel, he takes that as a ground. Now, Professor Kurtzer, you, you have been one of the first persons to really look at these newly opened Vatican archives, and you just shared that you found something of a folder on him with these later attempts to do something about it. Do you expect in your research to find more about him? Do you think we'll ever know anything related to what he's talking about? I don't know the, um, yeah, I might just, just fill in one kind of blank here, which, you know, we're talking about those two days and you know, who gets freed and who didn't. Um, they they uh, rounded up something, I forget the exact number, something like 1,275 people as presumed Jews who would be deported to their death. Yes. And, um, but 250 of those were released before they put the people on the train. Who were the 250 who were released? The ones of mixed them, marriages. Excuse me? Mixed marriages and children. Right, are... so, but uh, one thing you do find in these newly opened archives is that the Pope or the uh, Secretary of State of the Vatican 
was sending a list of baptized Jews who had been seized to the uh, German authorities and uh, calling on them to release the baptized Jews. And the um, smaller number of cases of Jews married to Catholics who were pledged to raise their children as Catholics. Um, so, uh, you know, it's interesting because you hear a lot about, well, Nazis have this racial idea about Jews and it didn't matter, you know, a Jew is a Jew, it didn't matter if they got baptized or not. Um, in Rome, in the run, run, rounding up the Jews, they were concerned about the Pope and keeping on the Pope's good side. They had maintained uh, amicable relations with the Pope and with the Vatican during their occupation and were eager to continue to do so in part for pro propaganda reasons, um, because the allies were working very hard to put out the opposite propaganda that the Germans were planning to kidnap the Pope and, and uh, do violence against church and so forth. Uh, so, you know, this I think is interesting. Now it doesn't, didn't help Pollock who was um, not, not baptized and, and uh, not married to a, a nun, to a Catholic. Um, but this is, is kind of the background of what was going on. In terms of finding um, other documents, I think it is possible. There are millions of pages of documents in the, in the Vatican archives. And, um, you know, we're still, I'm still uh, working away with some colleagues there and uh, we're, so perhaps we can have a reunion of the, year, of the novel <laughs> a year from now or two years from now and uh, new findings about the case and you could have a uh, new afterward to the 10th edition of the novel. Okay, we will soon open up to questions from the audience. You can use the chat if anybody has questions for either one of our speakers. Um, yeah. Um, I, have, I have a question I can ask uh, Hans, which is the, uh, I'm curious about the German reaction since the book came out earlier in Germany. Um, what kinds of questions, if, if we had this kind of event in, in Germany, what kinds of questions would people have been asking that might have been different than the ones that we've been talking about? Um, that is very interesting because uh, I didn't have so many events because, uh, because of the pandemic, obviously. Uh, but some, and it was uh, it always started with a um, uh, with mentioning what we were talking about now for the first time. But it was much more focused on the archaeologic thing, and of the role of um, uh, Pollock as a Jew um, who was not allowed to become a professor. And it was not um, the um, uh, uh, the historical situation in 1943. It was uh, really more, it, it, um, uh, more the, um, uh, yeah, the discovery of this biography and uh, the de kind of being disturbed that something like a classical statue, which is in the Vatican, has been in the Vatican since the Renaissance, can change its meaning. That was very often um, a sort of uh, um, the uh, the beginning of the discussions. So it was um, it was a different uh, it was it definitely was a different focus. And I'm very curious. Next week I will be in Rome and in Florence for different discussions how they will approach it, um, because there are these different stories being told. And um, but I guess that the situation. Um, of uh, um, uh, literature dealing with um, Holocaust uh, stories and Holocaust written in, in Germany is um, is a different one. It's uh, there. There are many, and um, it is not very well. Popular is the wrong word in this context, anyway. But it is not. It is. Um, there's a kind of. Uh, uh, yeah, not a lack of interest is the wrong word, but maybe, um, uh, but many people say we have heard so much, we have talked so much. Um, overload. Uh, there is an overload uh, situation in the bookmark, in, in the bookshops. That is, so I realized that there was always the shift to the archeologic uh, story after the beginning uh, with the Holocaust story, which I thought was very interesting because I didn't expect that. In, in for for readers, I mean this uh, um, 
the story of Lacoran is so much of a multi-layer story. And the way that this novel beautifully portrays it is a way that invites you to learn more. And if you scratch the surface of these stories, it's just an endless re rec receding series of stories. For instance, you know, the this this, this sculpture was made by three sculptors in, in, from Rhodes in ancient Greek. Uh, in antiquity, they say that the, 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 the sculptural group was outside the uh, Emperor Titus palace. Now, em Emperor Titus has such a strong uh, uh, echo meaning for the, for the Jews of Rome. So that's one story. And then while in the Renaissance, uh, this particular statue was seen as a masterpiece of the Hellenistic period. Later, there were all these people who loved it, but also very important detractors. Charles Darwin hated it. Uh, William Blake has a wild version of this thing. He thinks it's not Lacoran at all. It is actually the Jewish diet, deity, and it's a fragment uh, from, the, from, <laughs> from the Temple of Solomon. So, you know, it, it, it really encompasses all kinds of different um, stories and different hypotheses. And I think that what the novel ignites is a curiosity on how our culture in different points attributes different meanings to the same facts and to the same objects. So I think that this is really one of the most important things. And it's, it, it's fascinating and interesting, but for me, when it comes to the moral choice of Pollock with his life, we're entering a different realm. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting to see how these things, two things work together. And sometimes I feel they don't work together, in fact. I see. <laughs> um, well, but I would say they, they are both there. So if, if you follow the story, it is there. So there is no, um, there was no solution to that. There was no solution um, to give to the moral question what he's doing with his life. Um, that would have meant to speculate about that and write a completely different novel. And I would definitely not have dared to do that. Um, so m m my only possibility uh, was to leave that open. Uh, and I'm very aware that I did. Um, but um, I would say it was the only possibility to tell the story. Can you imagine uh, writing a new novel of that's in any way similar or take any strand of this and or approach that you use that because the approach is quite, uh, perhaps it's not unique, but um, somewhat unusual. And uh, I mean, it's, it's a beautifully written book. And, and also, as you mentioned earlier, beautifully translated. Um, but is it a kind of model for other, other novels you could imagine? As a matter of fact, yes. As a matter of fact, um, I have a concrete idea, um, which, but it would be another time um, and um, another subject, but also also the also playing with history, art history, uh, a lot of research and fiction. Um, I'm not going to tell more exact exact that it will be the same place, the Rome. Oh. Always a good choice. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, okay, just just uh, just to go back to uh, this is a little bit uh, maybe uh, David raised the question of who who was liberated among the people who were arrested and why this particular family wasn't. I have another question that maybe David has an answer for, but it seems to me that of the one thousand twenty two people who actually departed on that train. They were very, very few, a handful of foreign Jews. Now, the status of the children of Pollock seemed to me to fall into this very ambiguous category where they probably became Italian, 
but they became Italian after 1919, meaning that they were then stateless. I think that this might explain something about it, but I'm not sure if you're familiar with the technicalities of this. Well, the, um, actually the racial laws, which uh, went into effect in um, 1938, so now we're talking five years earlier, uh, one of the first racial laws was aimed at non-Italian Jews, uh, foreign Jews who were ordered out of the country within six months. That tended to be postponed a bit. Uh, but at a certain point, they were then, uh, those who remained were ordered into concentration camps. So there were Italian, there were many Italian concentration camps, something most people don't uh, know. Uh, and they were largely for non-Italian Jews. And um, you, in these newly opened Vatican archives, you have reports from some Vatican, um, the Nuncio, for example, to Italy, uh, visited uh, some of these in, in southern Italy and, and sent in reports of, uh, of their activities. These were not exterminationist camps, but they were, were concentration camps. And once the Germans take over the country, uh, they then do become conduits for sending Jews to their death at Auschwitz uh, primarily. Uh, but it is a kind of interesting question that, uh, so, so the, uh, it may have been 1919 was the distinguishing uh, point that you couldn't become naturalized after that and be considered Italian if you were Jewish. Uh, but of course, both of Pollock's children would have been born before 1919. And um, so uh, I think they would have been born before 19, yeah. So uh, yeah. they presumably were born in, in Italy. I haven't seen the documents. And um, they were born in Rome, all, th all three uh, of them. So they may not have been, even though their parents were, were foreign, um, uh, yeah, they presumably escaped be that categorization in that way. Okay, I'm, though, I'm, I'm I should add that it, Italy still today doesn't have a use solely. It's you're not, the fact that you were born in Italy doesn't automatically make you a, an Italian citizen. Yeah, so there's a question, what, what, what was their citizenship? It might have some relevance for the story. But another aspect that's fascinating about Pollock to me is that, you know, at the point where uh, the story begins and ends, really, he's a man of, in his 70s, 75, something like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, a scholar who's been over 50 years in Italy, in his particular position, working with so many archaeological treasures that were of relevance to the Vatican, he, had, he was in a very privileged position in a way to have met three popes. Mm -hmm. And he had dealings with Pope Pius X, the 11th and the 12th. Um, and they, and they, um, they accepted him um, and worshiped him very much. And, he, um, and uh, not only the popes, uh, also museum directors in the whole world, for, for example, for Berlin, where the most important was Wilhelm Bode, who founded the big, um, the big Prussian art museum. And he only bought in Rome, uh, he, he only bought from him. And he, he, when he was in Berlin, he was brought to Max Liebermann and all the best. Uh, um, most. He, so he had this, this was another thing that, uh, uh, fascinated me and and um, and also made it extremely sad and upset that he he made a, he tried to become a professor he was rejected then he found an alternative by doing those catalogs by doing the research by becoming such an important dealer um, by, and then um, consequence of World War One is that all this is destroyed and from there it is like getting on this, um, uh, in this movement, getting down and not only, um, and he fights it for, for pretty, a pretty long time. He does fight it for himself and for his family and for his love to Rome and his believing in, in a good, and then there is a shift then. Um, and that is when he starts to define as a Jew what he never did before. And then in the end, that is not fiction, that is from, I have this from his diaries and his letters, that he only read Jewish literature in the end. Um, and that he completely concentrated on this, what he was forced to be. Um, and he did this, this obviously with the same strength than he did the other things before. And I thought that was, um, I never had, um, 
experience that in a biography so close to one person um, as I did it in, in, in this case. So he was very aware about his privileged position as long as he had it. And again, this was for me psychologically a model what, could, what he could have thought in 1943, that he never believed that he could be kicked out of Italy in 1919. Uh, and we have that in the letters, it, it, it will not happen, not with us. Um, and then they were warned by the embassy and had to, uh, um, had to run away in the middle of the night because it was obviously the last moment to, to get to Zurich. All his friends had been gone already. Another yeah. thing, another thing that ended for him, and I think it's very important, perhaps you want to say something about it because it's so fascinating, uh, is that for many, many years, uh, all these personal, very important personalities, artistic personalities coming to Rome from Germany and France and everywhere, would he would be the point person to show them around. So you have beautiful episodes of him parading around the, Richard Strauss or Auguste Rodin and some of these people, that also ended, but perhaps you want to say we can end it with his role as a chaperone of Rome, very sophisticated chaperone of Rome for- Yeah, the, um, I, um, for, for, German, for Germans, German literature, Gerhard Hauptmann uh, by the time was a very important um, person. And he, he said to him that he was looking for him for three days because he only wanted to have him um, uh, to show him around, and um, uh, also uh, some princes uh, from uh, German courts hired, kind of hired him to travel with him around uh, um, Rome. So he was um, he was known all over Europe as the person who knows, um, yeah, who knows very much about antique art and the difference to professors was that as a dealer and as an author of catalogues he was much more into society than professors who were in university i think that is one uh, one of the reasons and it, it was not his choice but it was what his life offered to him and he enjoyed it and he um uh, he did it, and then he became honorary director of the Museo Baracco, which was a very special collection. It was a collection by a, um, uh, a very rich uh, noble who collected um, antique art in order to teach people how this art developed. It's a really fantastic, and he gave it to, the, to the, the city of Rome as a donation, this collection, and even built on his own expenses, a museum, a beautiful little museum, which was destroyed by Mussolini. But today the collection can be seen. Um, and when this um, Baron Baracco died, he said to Pollock, you are the only one who can do that. And um, he took over that and, and he added from his own collection, he bought um, uh, extra pieces of art to enlarge this collection. So he had a very social um, uh, uh, and responsible approach to, um, to Rome as a place of antique art. That was, that, that was his life. And he has another life, which is certainly, this is something all, all discussions in Germany go about obviously, and not in, uh, but not in, not in America. That he was absolutely uh, crazy about Goethe. Yeah. Um, so that that was, um, and um, but I think even that is um, is quite understandable because he was he projected this idea of culture on him, and he himself as a German in Rome, and Goethe for him Goethe always was somebody who was in Rome. Um, and uh, he always believed in this high idea of culture, which is shown in antique art and then again shining in, uh, in, uh, in literature, um, in the literature of Goethe. And I thought that was very interesting how he focused on these, um, uh, on these cultural things. Thank you very much. I think we need to wrap this up a little bit. If anybody has a late question, we can entertain it. Otherwise, uh, 
I just want to remind everybody that we just touched upon some very, very big issues, but the novel is packed with information and fascinating stories and a lot more of what we could possibly put into an hour. And I would like also to acknowledge and congratulate uh, New Vessel Press for having translated this in English in such a timely way. I think it's a beautiful book and that could lead to much discussion, both historical and literary. May I thank you very much for this, um, for the great introduction uh, you, you gave to this evening and um, uh, for having this discussion um, with, uh, with us. And also to you, David, thank you very much that you did that. And, and this was very interesting for me as well and a great um, discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. I think Christine from Rizzoli has some closing remarks. Yeah, I, I also just want to thank Centro Primo Levi for co-hosting this with us and New Vessel Press. Um, and of course, to our speakers, David, Hans and Alessandro, it was a great pleasure to, to have you tonight speaking. Right, we've recorded this conversation and we'll make it available on our YouTube channel in, in, in the next few days. So if you would like to view it there, it will be available there. And this is the beautiful book, Pollock's Arm, and we hope you'll, you'll get a copy and support an independent bookstore in Manhattan. Um, we're at 1133 Broadway, and I, I've shared the link um, to purchase it on our website, too, if you don't live in the city. So thank you all. And thank you very much. with that, we'll, we'll close. Have a, have a wonderful night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank very, you much. very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much.